So, this is cascade control very com very common and gives significant performance in, in improvements over uh, very affordable costs in most cases and therefore, are widely used. Now, we look at some other control structures namely selective override and <coughs> split range control. So, first start with selective control. So, as we, as we said that what we are doing here is that uh, we are just what, what are we doing the, 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 the loop is standard the only change comes here. So, what we have shown here is that the same sensor the actually we have shown that as if the same sensor values are being uh, the same process values are being fed, but actually that is not so. This means that the same process variable for example, room temperature are being sensed by three different sensors which are at three different locations. So, therefore, although they are being tapped from here. So, these signals are not identical, but they are they are they will be similar. And then here we have some I mean <coughs> selection or basically signal processing scheme. So, we can so what signal what signal processing scheme we will apply depends on what we want to achieve. So, for example, if you want to achieve an overall temperature of this room. So, then we should and some sort of an average then we should take then take an average value this this process should not select, but rather take average. <coughs> if you want to know if you want to ensure that in no corner of the room the temperature will be more than 25 degree centigrade then we should take the <coughs> highest temperature of these three and try to control that. So, temperature at every point of the room will be more than the set temp or the will be less than the set temperature. So, in case of room cooling that that is the case. So, in that case we can we can choose the maximum value right. <coughs> there are even other applications for example, sometimes you know there are very catastrophic effects can can occur in occur in feedback control loops if one of the sensors fail. So, you can imagine that if there was a single sensor feedback <coughs> and if the sensor failed some some wire torn or something got burnt out or some electronic circuit problem immediately suppose that this signal goes to 0 due to failure. Then what will happen this will the 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 controller will have no way of knowing it and it will simply see an error and therefore, it will try to drive the process unnecessarily, but that driving will not will not improve this value because it is due to a failure it is not sensing anymore. So, in such cases industrial accidents may result equipment may get, get damaged. So, what people often do is that they take S1, S2 they will put three sensors suppose to sense the same variable and then they will put a voting logic that is if all three of the sensors are working are normal they have not failed then their readings are going to be very close. If any one of the sensor readings goes significantly away. So, two of the sensor readings are here while the third one is here means that the third one could be faulty. So, in which case the third one's value will not be used in control. So, it will be cut out and only the average of these two will be used. This is called triple sensor voting, triple sensor voting and often applied in various you know critical control loops. So, by doing this you can achieve a certain degree of sensor fault tolerance. So, in such situations you can use sensor uh, selective control there are there are even other situations where basically uh, where you can do median filtering that is you can select outliers when you, if suddenly one sensor gets a big piece of noise then if you choose always the middle value then you can reject noise better. So, you can it you can also use it for doing various kinds of filtering. So, uh, <coughs> So, selection of feedback for either mean, mini, minimal maximum values or mean values or median or 
mode values. So depending on various applications you could choose. This is selective control. Very common sense approach but can sometimes give you significant protection from things like failures. Coming to override control. <clears throat> In override control what we are, we are a sync, I mean the same system could be operated based on two, uh, based on two different you know modes or philosophies. So they are, so basically it is something like an if then else logic that if as long as this is happening operate the system in this way, but if that happens operate it that way. So essentially this control loop is a uh, sort of a supervisory structure which uh, switches between in this case it will it will switch between <coughs> uh, two sensors to drive the same actuator and which sensor it will be used depend on which mode it wants to operate the system in. So typical example as a common sense example here you have some something like a boiler uh, where you, you are getting feed water and you are having heat input. So you are producing let us say steam. So, uh, so what happens is that you are you are, you are producing steam you, you have water and so there is a water level and steam is going out and being used for some purpose maybe for maybe it is a it is a steam plant for the for another for the whole factory where several where steam is required for several other purposes for heating up certain things. So what you want is that you want neither the you do not want the this this level to fall to two, two low levels. So if it falls to very low levels then immediately the it is a level loop which should get preference. On the other hand if this uh, if the uh, if this if the pressure the, the the pressure of the steam should not go beyond a certain limit because then that may cause leaks that may cause accidents so if the pressure goes up to a, over a certain limit then the pressure control mechanism should take precedence so you are having two different control loops and which one will take precedence in a in a given situation that depends on uh, the state of two two variables so that happens that is happening because it is it's like it's like a protective scheme essentially because the controls will be actually so it you know coordinates because how much of steam will be finally drawn here that is also not in not in the within the purview of this of this controller similarly how much of feed water is going to be fed in that is not also within the purview of this controller so what happens is that if this level is uh, <coughs> if this level is falls too low then what will happen is that the judicious strategy will be to close this valve so that steam is not going out so that will that will raise that will what will, what will cause is that the that the uh, level will rise so we are, will will not draw steam from here and similarly if the pressure goes too high then also we should close the valve because otherwise it will uh, so the pressure will will be controlled so in a, depending on these two modes so closing the valve means a lower input opening the valve means higher input so whichever one needs to close the valve that 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 one will will be used so this is so one in one situation one control strategy will override over the other so that's why it's called an override so very simple and essentially these are this is a supervisory control I should say because you are because at, this is more like you know supervising the supervising the process and changing the changing the configuration of the process. So uh -uh. Coming back to the next one, the last one that is split range control. The first example is of heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So we have the standard, this is the space that we want to control. There is a temperature transmitter and there is a temperature controller. And we also have a set temperature which we generally set using a dial or 
sometimes using remotes nowadays and the temperature is is affected either by hot water you know if you in in countries abroad for heating rooms they have they have uh, heat exchangers installed in rooms various corners of the room and through which they say they send uh, hot water or you can have cold air as in as in air conditioning and depending on whether you want to heat the room or cool the room that is depending on the set temperature which if whether it is greater than ambient or or less than ambient you have to either activate this actuator or activate this actuator so this is so on some range of error so, so uh, some range of the set temperature so when the set temperature is greater than the ambient temperature in that range you use this actuator there is a hot water actuator and when the set temperature is below the ambient temperature in that range you use the cold air actuator so the, this is why it's called a split range control because the range is split into two different control modes so uh, so you see that typically speaking this is the ambient temperature point this is the ambient temperature point and if the set temperature is above it then as the error increases the hot water valve gradually gets opened so the so the control input that is the overall control input to the to the process which changes its temperature in this temperature range it will gradually rise and then finally will become stable similarly when the set temperature is below ambient temperature then the cold water valve characteristic will be followed and that will rise so the overall control input characteristic is like this over the two ranges and in this range in this range you operate the cold water valve and in this range you operate the hot water valve so this is the standard uh, hvac control of spaces here is another example <coughs> which is uh, for a reactor which is very similar so here what you do is the reactor you want to control the pressure in the reactor so the pressure in the reactor could be either caused by controlling the uh, feed rate or by controlling the product outflow rate right so in the initial part of pressure you control the you gradually open the you gradually um, open the product valve so you see this is the product valve characteristic after some time the product valve is fully open so it cannot be so the pressure is is increasing so <coughs> you gradually open the product valve now if at this after this point the pressure cannot be affected by the product valve because the product valve is fully closed so in that situation you start closing the feed valve so the feed valve is operated here so actually your true operating characteristic is this time you open product valve and this time you close feed valve so this is split range control where you have one only one sensor but many actuators so mm -mm. so we this is we have come to the end of the lecture and just want to have some concluding remarks firstly on this kind of this multi sensor multi actuator control which is processes often need supervisory control logic so you see that you apart from your basic control logic which is there in the either in the hot water valve or in the cold water valve there will be an automatic controller but even we have we above that you need some logic based on again process variables which will ensure which one will be working which sensor will be active which actuator will be active which controller will be active so this is called supervisory control logic and they of for process operations you often need that so this is sometimes achieved by these control loops so you can switch among operational modes and these supervisory control logic schedules sensors actuators connects sometimes use this actuator sometimes use that actuator so <clears throat> based on operating points and set points and only one thing is that when you are you must ensure that when you are switching from one mode to another uh, too much you know bumps 
we have considered bumpless transfers in the context of PID control. So we should not have too much, too many bumps uh, when you are transferring the from one mode to another because that sometimes is not good for actuators or plants. So that brings us to the end of the process control uh, module. From the next lesson, we will enter a different module of sequence control. So what did we learn in this module, you know industrial just some comp I mean concluding remarks that industrial processes have sometimes have very complex dynamics, they have phase lag, they have non-linearity, gains will change. But so that creates complexity, but at the same time the um, process dynamics is slow. So sometimes it is good in the sense that you know fast processes are difficult to control. But at the same time sometimes you know disturbances also travel slow and they are uh, they should be detected early otherwise the uh, large errors may may persist may persist for unacceptably long times so one has to take care of sensor and actuator nonlinearities the one of the major actuators called flow valves have significant nonlinearities several uh, sensors like you know temperature sensors flow sensors also have nonlinearities so they should be taken into account <coughs> And typically in I think around 90 percent of the cases PID controllers are used uh, sometimes with various uh, special configurations for uh, anti wind up, for bump place transfer etc. as we have seen for special uh, structure for feeding back derivatives. But generally the controllers are PID, they are very extremely common and PID controllers have to be tuned you know control tuning can have significant impact on uh, controllers and there are various uh, for example modern day modern day controllers come with uh, very uh, quite sophisticated features of of tuning software uh, <coughs> so tuning is very much required uh, and you also need sometimes some supervisory logic to you know improve performance, prevent failures, carry, carry out diagnostics. So all these are also necessary. Similarly, uh, supervisory logic may also be used to treat interaction between multiple control loops. And finally, often for taking care for getting the best results often various kinds of uh, special control structures have to be used. But the, the good thing is that with years of experience uh, for most of the common industrial processes very well known solutions exist. So one need not uh, worry too much. So that's, that brings us to the end of the process control module from the next lesson we shall take up sequence control and coming to a lesson review we have, we have seen problems of single sensor control, cascade control and multi sensor multi actuator control in the form of selective override and split range. Points to ponder, give, <coughs> so you have, you, you mentioned what for, for what kind of processes cascade control is likely to be effective. So take some examples and, and examine how the, uh, how the, the two subsystems should be such that process control is, is effective, is effective. Why higher stability margin leads to improved transient response? That is why <coughs> uh, that you can try to explain it, it is related to the basically related to the range of controller gains that you can have and draw the block diagram of a cascade control loop for a practical industrial process. This is very important uh, and one should be able to draw it. Similarly, block diagrams of selective control loops and override and split range control loops are useful exercises to be done. So thank you very much.